The next phylum that we deal with is phylum Echinodermata. One by one we have seen each phylum in the kingdom Animalia and we get to know that uh, whatever classification is being made, one thing is kept in consideration that is the phylogenetic relationships are kept in the mind and uh, the phylums that we come across one by one, we see that there is some level of development and evolution we can say. They, the next phylum that we come across is often superior than the previous one, this is what happens and so is in the case of Echinodermata. What you you see over here is a few echinoderms and the most typical example is that of starfish and what you uh, oftenly uh, come across in the case of echinoderms that must be in your knowledge if I talk about starfish that it is present in the ocean uh, you know ocean lower ocean zones that is ocean floor it would be present next to the ocean floor. So, we are going to see what would be the basic characteristics present in an animal if it is to be classified into phylum echinodermata. First of all, we break this name and when we break this name, we get to see that there are two words echino and dermata. The first thing that we have echinus is basically spines. So, echino word is derived from echinus which means spines and dermata is skin. So, they would have spiny skin that would be present. These are the examples that are given. Now, they have an endoskeleton made up of calcareous ossicles which are mesodermal in origin. So, there is a mesodermal skeleton that is present and it would be uh, made up of calcareous ossicles. Next thing that we have in our consideration is that there would be organ system level of organization. They would be triploblastic and coelomate of course, they would be uh, coelomate organisms. Otherwise, they would not have been placed in the ninth position in uh, non-chordates and phylum echinodermata comes after all the phylums we have discussed. So, we have discussed till now that there are uh, triploblastic phylums and coelomate organisms which are present and as I told you, there is uh, the endoskeleton that is of mesodermal origin. So, they are going to have three layers and inside those three layers there would be coelom which would be present. Now, one thing you uh, are seeing over here is that they are placed in the ninth position. They are phylogenetically placed and we are very well taking into consideration the evolutionary relationships and the complexity in terms of body organization. So, what we see over here is that the symmetry happens to be radial symmetry and when I say radial symmetry it is pentaradial basically. Now, when I mean pentaradial, when I say pentaradial you can associate what the meaning would be as you can see it is having 5 arms over there. So, the radial symmetry would be present in each arm. So, that is why it is pentaradial symmetry. But now you would be a little bit confused and surprised because in the beginning when we started with kingdom animalia I had told you that bilateral symmetry is the symbol of development basically. Those organisms which had radial symmetry they were placed way before earlier in the first and second phylums as we had discussed uh, not uh, first and second the second and third that was Nidaria and uh, Tenophores. So, we were discussing about those phylums they were radially symmetrical. When we talk about the phylum which is at the ninth position which comes after mollusks and arthropods and that is having radial symmetry it might baffle you a bit but you do not have to be uh, confused or concerned about it because what is present in this phylum which places them at the ninth position is that their larva that is brachiolarva that larva is basically a bilaterally symmetrical larva. Now, because they have indirect development and we talk about larval development that larva is showing a bilateral symmetry while the adult is showing the radial symmetry which means that these organisms are somewhat close to the chordates because they have close resemblance to the chordates. The larva that we would talk about that would be in close proximity to those of the chordates. So, that is why we have this phylum at the ninth position. Moving further, they have have a complete digestive system. Now, when we talk about complete digestive system, you have to keep in mind that they have a ventral mouth and dorsal anus that is present in their system. Ventral mouth and dorsal is anus. Okay. This is the arrangement. Now, what you would see over here, let us see the basic body plan of this echinoderm. This is the starfish that we are having. 
these are the five arms that are present. You would see a peculiar arrangement of tube feet that is present. We would come to know that this tube feet is an important part of water vascular system which is important for the respiration and circulation. But before that, what we see over here is that there are digestive glands, there is central ring canal, there is a stomach, the dorsal side is having the anus, there is a madriparite through which all the water enters the body and this is the actual arrangement. The digestive system is complete because it is having two openings, one ventral and other one is uh, dorsal. Over here you can see the actual arrangement clearly you can see the endoskeletal plates all right, which are calcareous. You have a sieve plate through which the madriparite would be connected and all the movement of water inside would go. And there are eye spots, there are tube feet which are not shown over here. The, these are basically the digestive glands. In the previous diagram we had seen that there were tube feet which were present. There is a central disc. The cardiac stomach lies over here. Each arm has been shown and this basically gives you an idea that these are spiny organisms as you can see over here. That is why the name is echinoderms and just for a basic understanding of the body structure we have this organization depicted. Now this is sea star that we are talking about that is starfish and we have the water vascular system that we are going to discuss. Now this water vascular system is for respiration as well as digestion as well as it is having you must have seen in the previous diagram that wherever this radial canal is present there are digestive glands which are present. So this basic system of water vascular system arrangement this is for digestive as well as circulatory and respiratory now this medriparite is the site from where the water would enter this water enters the medriparite from where it goes to this uh, this stone canal that is in association with the ring canal this ring canal is in contact and continuity with each of the radial canal that is present. This radial canal has ampulla next to it and the ampulla are having the tube feet which are present. So this, this is basically the water vascular system of an echinoderm that is present and you must be surprised to know that they do not have an excretory system. If ever asked that which part of an, of an echinoderm is responsible for digestion and uh, movement you can say if you are being asked that which part is responsible. We are are going to we are going to refer to the water vascular system but if you are asked about a part that is responsible for these systems so you are going to uh, mention tube feet over there okay now moving further the reproduction is uh, sexual and there is one phenomena that is uh, the asexual reproduction that if it is present it would be present uh, by fragmentation it would take place by fragmentation and over here we do not talk about that fragmentation as asexual reproduction we talk about that the echinoderms they have high capacity of regeneration so over here what you come across is there is lot of regeneration that can take place and when regeneration is being considered supposedly one arm of this particular uh, starfish that is taken as example it is amputated from here that means it is cut from here it would grow that um, particularly because of regeneration so you can make it out that these organisms can be of great help their tissue structure study and if we get into what are the basic uh, proteins which are responsible for regeneration we can uh, come across the techniques and medical technology where we can regrow our organs amputated organs that is a different part but you need to remember that they have high capacity of regeneration and that regeneration could be termed in asexual reproduction but it is basically this phylum's exclusive feature. Now talking next there is indirect development as I told you the larva is radially symmetrical and the larva happens to be brachiolaria. So if you can remember the name it's good even if you don't you can associate that brachiolarial larva is the one which is having the bilateral symmetry in case of echinoderms. Now one by one we are going to see a few examples and learn their names what they are. First one is the sea star or what we call as starfish. So the first one is Asterius that is the starfish or the sea star. The second one is Echinus. 
the other name for this is aristotle's lantern okay otherwise it is known as sea urchin the one picture that we saw in the beginning that was at the third place take a look once again this was sea urchin basically then we have antidon that is sea lily all these are going to have spines on their body then we have cucumeria that is sea cucumber quite easy to learn this name if you get the common name cucumeria is sea cucumber then we have ophuria ophuria that is brittle star the one shown over here so what we have is the examples are here with us we have seen their reproduction that is going to be sexual they have high capacity of re regeneration what is their symmetry why they are placed in the ninth position they are coelomate they are triploblastic so this is all about echinoderms that we have to understand you have to learn these examples with the common names and it would be better if you see the pictures and learn the names according to those uh, that picture input that comes into your mind you'll be able to remember them for a longer time